A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here's what's coming up on the program this week. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, deeply concerned by ethnic dimension of the violence in West Darfur, appeals to countries to step up aid pledges for the war-torn region as fighting rages. And South Sudan's President Salva Kiir indicates interest to run for re-election as a country prepares to hold its first poll since independence. Plus, I'll be speaking with political analyst and international relations expert Professor Brooke Bisher on these issues. That's a, just a bit of what's coming up on the program. First, a quick check on other discussions in diplomatic circles, and we'll be right back. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu has been elected chairman of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government. The election happened on Sunday afternoon in Guinea-Bissau, where the president has been attending the 63rd ordinary session of the community. Receiving the hand of a document from outgoing chairman, President Umar Mbalo of Guinea-Bissau, who had made a visit to Tinubu about two weeks ago, the Nigerian president promised to take democracy serious. NATO leaders will be gathering in Vilnius this week with the aim of overcoming divisions of Ukraine's push for a path to membership and to end Turkey's bloc of Sweden joining the transatlantic military alliance. U.S. President Joe Biden, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, French President Emmanuel Macron and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will be among the 31 NATO leaders attending the summit in Lithuania. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is also expected to attend and to press for Ukraine to be admitted into NATO soon after the Russian invasion of the country comes to an end. <music> Janet Yellen has described bilateral meetings with senior Chinese officials in recent days as direct and productive. Her comment follows 10 hours of meetings with senior Chinese officials, whom she said raised concerns about unexpected executive order restricting outbound investment. But she assured them any such measures would be highly targeted to avoid unnecessary repercussions. Fresh fighting broke out in the Sudanese city of Omdurman on Saturday, leaving at least 22 people dead. The city is very close to the capital, Khartoum, and an unspecified number of people were wounded in the attack. It's been referred to as one of the deadliest clashes in urban areas in the capital and elsewhere between the military and the rapid support forces. Fighting in Sudan has continued to rage as the army tries to cut supply lines of the rapid support forces, the RSF. Many people who fled the conflict in Juba, that's in South, neighboring South Sudan, are arriving across the border with nothing. Many of them say that they were subjected to violence and exploitation, such as extortion and looting, as they fled to the neighboring country. But President Salva Kiir is preparing to run for re-election next year, even though he's been the country's only president since 2011. Sudan's war has reignited violence in the western Darfur region. But those trying to flee El Ganina, described as a city of death, are increasingly being killed before they reach safety. The violence here has been driven by militias from Arab nomadic tribes, along with members of the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF. It is the paramilitary faction battling Sudan's army for power, predominantly in the capital Khartoum, the RSF was formed out of the feared Janjaweed Arab militias that helped the government crush a rebellion by manly non-Arab groups in Darfur two decades ago. RSF leader Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo says his force would investigate events in El Ganina. He accused the army of fomenting violence by armed tribes. A fighter jet was shut down in Khartoum a few days ago, where clashes and artillery fire targeted several neighborhoods in Sudan's war-torn capital. An eyewitness in northern Khartoum said he saw pilots parachuting as the plane nosedived towards the ground. Sudanese armed forces and political factions have condemned the killing of West Darfur Governor Kamis Abakar and El Ganena, prompting anger and frustration. 
الله اكبر احتياط المركزي الله اكبر Army Chief General Abdel Fattah Al Burhan was quoted as saying this was a treacherous attack by the paramilitary rapid support forces. The late Abakar had accused the RSF and allied militias of violence, which he called a genocide. A joint effort by the United States and Saudi Arabia to broker peace has had limited success with endless number of failed ceasefires. A regional African mission to find peace has so far not made any progress. According to a UN estimate, over 130,000 people have fled the fighting and crossed into South Sudan. Most Sudanese refugees have gone to Egypt and Chad also. Two million people have been forced from their homes seeking refuge in safer parts of Sudan. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, deeply concerned by ethnic dimension of violence in Sudan's West Darfur, has appealed for countries to step up aid pledges for the war-torn region where the conflict between warring rival military factions has forced some 2.2 million people from their homes and sparked a major humanitarian crisis. The scale and speed of Sudan's descent into death and destruction is unprecedented. Without strong international support, Sudan could, could quickly become a locus of lawlessness radiating insecurity across the region. The United Nations says about $3 billion is needed this year for humanitarian relief inside Sudan and for refugees fleeing the country, only a fraction of which has been funded. Germany announced that it was pledging 200 million euros to Sudan and the region until 2024, and Qatar pledged $50 million, while the UN aid chief Martin Griffiths said it was allocating an additional $22 million to address priority needs. An additional. $22 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund. However, the UN Humanitarian Affairs Coordinator in South Sudan, Peter van der Overet, has released $8 million, that's about £6.3 million pounds from the Humanitarian Fund, to provide life-saving assistance to the 150,000 people in the country who have fled the conflict in Sudan. The number of arrivals is projected to increase as the crisis continues. Onward transportation of South Sudanese returnees and Sudanese refugees from transit sites remains a significant challenge due to the combination of poor road infrastructure and insecurity in some areas. The conflict between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces began in mid-April amid tensions over an internationally backed plan for a transition towards elections under a civilian government. It has left more than 3,000 people dead turned the capital Khartoum into a war zone and triggered deadly violence in the conflict-scarred western region of Darfur, as well as other parts of the country. Meanwhile, South Sudan is to hold its first election since independence, and President Salva Kiir has indicated interest to run for re-election in the long-delayed polls. No other candidate has declared to contest the election, though the first vice president, Riek Machar, is expected to run. Mr. Kier has been president since independence in 2011 after a long-running civil war, but conflict continued even after independence. Civil war broke out in 2013 when the president fell out with Mr. Mashar. A power-sharing agreement was signed between the warring parties in August 2018 in a bid to bring the five-year civil war to an end. The mandate of the transitional government, which was due to end in 2022, was extended to allow the leaders address challenges with the implementation of the peace agreement. Mr. Kier has promised to address these challenges before the elections set for December next year. Joining me now to discuss the situation in Sudan and to touch very briefly on neighboring South Sudan is political analyst and international relations expert, Professor Brooke Bisha. Professor Bisha is a nationally recognized academician with years of lecturing in the fields of political communication, international relations and international media. He has years of foreign policy and diplomacy experience in bilateral and multilateral fora. Is currently at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Professor Bishat, thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your program. It's a pleasure having you. And what a topic we have today before us. What is your understanding about the recent crisis in Sudan, how it started? 
thank you. Uh, uh, Sudan uh, uh, is one of the key countries in uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, the current crisis literally started uh, uh, almost three, three months ago. Uh, on April 15th, uh, the crisis started. And uh, what is most uh, tragic is this fighting is going in the desert or not out where there are no civilians living there. This crisis, this fighting is going on in the middle or at the heart of the capital city of the Sudan. That's in um, that's in the, in Khartoum, in Umdroman, and uh, now the the fighting has spread over in so many areas, all the way up to the Chadian border, in what we call the Darfur region. And as to the cause, really, it is right between two generals who know each other for many many years. Um, that's why some analysts will say this is also a fight uh, of uh, between uh, quote unquote uh, the, the two egos of the two gentlemen. If only, if only one of them or both of them would, would stop and uh, attend the dialogue or sit around the, 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 the table uh, and try to find uh, a solution and stop the pain of uh, millions of the Sudanese people who are now marching or fleeing into Ethiopia, into Chad, Central Africa, into so many areas. That would have been a great, a great, a great service for the people of the Sudan. But instead, I'll give it back to you, but instead, uh, they are fighting uh, to the end, it seems. And in that process, as always, when two elephants fight, as our, as our African proverb says, it is the people who get hurt. So I give it back to you. And it is sad that they don't see it, you know, the way it is. But the East African Regional Organization wants to hold a meeting to discuss the crisis. Do you think that they have a good enough knowledge uh, on how to do this? Uh, the Eastern African group, you mean? Yes. Yes. They do. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, yes, they do. We have what's called, uh, let's say, in West Africa, uh, you know, there is the ECOWAS. And in the eastern side of Africa, the Horn of Africa, we have the IGAD or IGAD, we call it. And around eight or nine members uh, are, uh, are members, or all the way to Uganda, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti, and Kenya are members. So what is now happening, actually, as we speak now, uh, the heads of state and delegations are expected to arrive in Addis. Uh, who, uh, it is going to be led by William Ruto, His Excellency President William Ruto of Kenya. He will be joined by uh, Salva Kiir of South Sudan and also, and also uh, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, um, uh, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, the four gentlemen, the four leaders are going to deliberate starting tonight in Addis, Sunday, and Monday officially, uh, how to find a solution, uh, how to bring the, the fighting to, uh, to, to, to how to bring peace in, in, in the Sudan. So they have been delegated, by the way, by IGAD, the region, and the backing of the other members to find the solution. In so doing, they are hoping to bring the two gentlemen uh, to so that they talk and at least a cessation of hostilities agreement will take its shape and then, and then eventually some kind of a, an, an understanding and an agreement of a ceasefire will be signed. That is the hope. Yes, so once again, to answer your question, yes, they are capable of doing that. But the point is that the two gentlemen are ready to compromise first, are ready to put aside, secondly, their egos. Third, whether the two gentlemen are ready to put the people of Sudan, the suffering people of Sudan, above their own egos. If that happens, one of them should concede. One of them should, should say, yes, for the sake of Sudan, for the sovereignty of the people of Sudan, I will compromise. So that is what is lacking. And we do hope and cross our fingers that the two gentlemen will first send their emissaries to Addis Ababa, and eventually the two leaders will make short trips to Addis, so that they will come to a compromise into some kind of an agreement. And we do. The solution, it looks okay. really simple, doesn't it? Um, one person has to concede, the other person has to uh, be gracious about it. But how has the war impacted on Ethiopia where you live? Um, Sudan is a neighbor of Ethiopia, and Europe, uh, Ethiopia itself is playing a significant role in uh, peace negotiations. How has the war impacted on, on the country? Great question. Thank you for that question. As uh, uh, 
Um, uh, Sudan and Ethiopia are so close. Sudan, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Eritrea and Sudan are very, very close. We share the same people in the common border areas, speaking the same language. You know, you know uh, as, a as a result of the colonialism process, this uh, artificial border, border marking of the dividing the uh, same people living in uh, uh, their own state into different states. Uh, so we have a common common, so many commonalities. So yes, it has affected Ethiopia and other neighboring countries. Thousands and thousands are coming daily uh, to the to the western side of uh, Ethiopia. The Ethiopian government, the Disaster Relief Commission and Agency, as well as supported by the World Food Program of the United Nations and other United Nations aff aff affiliates, uh, specialized organizations, are working hard, providing food, shelter, uh, high protein food to little kids with moms, pregnant moms, lactating moms, and the like, this is provided. But the tragedy is the number is not going down, but it's going very, very high. Uh, as a matter of border and on over to the, to the Chadian uh, sovereign uh, territory. So it is a tragedy uh, we are watching on TV. Uh, the efforts of the Ethiopian government and Ethiopia as a federal state, the regional federal states in the neighboring uh, country of the Sudan are working hard, uh, and uh, the problem is going is, is getting immense and very, very large. And we do hope that this material um, and uh, support, food, and, and the like would continue flowing, because the concern is that uh, once the stock, the stock uh, that the United Nations has is going down, then people are going to die. South Sudan is planning to hold its presidential elections next year to be the first one since the country became independent of Sudan in uh, 2011. Are you concerned the conflict in Sudan could somehow impact on, uh, you know, this election next year? The election might not be held, I would predict, due to two factors. One, domestic factor in uh, South Sudan, in, in South Sudan, and also at the other end also consequences. And if this state of things continues in Sudan, more war, more conflict, more the expansion of the conflict areas, the election might not be held in uh, South Sudan. Just uh, for a minute, uh, Professor, you know, the, the AU right now and uh, IGAD is more concentrated on what's going on in Sudan. And mm -hmm. I'm glad that you mentioned you know, that South Sudan has its own domestic problems, which may result in, you know, the elections not holding next year mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, but are they as concerned about what's going on in South Sudan? Um, because all this focus is on Sudan right now because there's a conflict there. There's lots of fighting and civilians are right in the middle of it. But who's worried about what's currently going on in South Sudan? It's not just an election that's holding in South Sudan. It's also people's welfare you know, in the country. This is a country that's had a president for such a long time, and nothing really seems to be moving. Um, lots of um, aid has been pumped into South Sudan, but there doesn't seem to be real progress in the country. I, I would say the, the attention on South, South Sudan has been taken over by Sudan proper, Khartoum Sudan, because of uh, what is happening in Sudan for the last... Uh, literally, since April 2019. Since the removal of uh, from power of uh, the authoritarian rule, uh, hence in South Sudan issues there are still outstanding issues. Uh, yes, there is relative peace in South Sudan, but there is outstanding issues between uh, you know political issues uh, that were resolved uh, a bit uh, several years before, but still uh, there are forces led by the president Salva Kiir, and there are also by uh, the vice president, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, still a very, um, uh, he has a position of the vice presidency, but still outstanding issues are there. Uh, Rick Mashar, I mean, the vice president and the president. Uh, uh, we do hope that they will not go back to civil war and civil uh, conflict in a very, very broad way. We do hope again against all hopes, but the tension that is now precipitating and developing in North Sudan. And especially there are areas and territories in South Sudan which are directly affected 
by the political conflicts in, Sud in, in Sudan, like South Kordofan state, like Bluenland state. And on top of that, Abiyye. Why is Abiyye more complicated? Because it is so oil rich area, both countries that is South Sudan, as well as Sudan proper, they are contesting the, the, the claiming uh, Abiyye as theirs. Still, that is the most, that's the number one outstanding uh, issue with, between the two uh, sovereign countries. Therefore, I would say this is, the matter is more complicated. Uh, we do hope that uh, issues uh, in South Sudan will not once again uh, develop, but there are common day problems like uh, fight over grazing land. Uh, there are cattle wrestling uh, tribes, uh, even on the border of Ethiopia, on more on the border of North Sudan and South Sudan. These are the, uh, the, uh, the fight over grazing land, fight over water, fight over cattle wrestling and, and, and the like. So these issues are still uh, there in, the, in South Sudan. And we, uh, since the the birth and independence of uh, South Sudan. We do hope that South Sudan will uh, have uh, peace. But if there is a lack of peace in South Sudan, uh, add, add, add all the factors in the Sudan. Thank you so much, Professor Bisha, for speaking with me on Diplomatic Channel. Appreciate your thoughts and your analysis on the issues. It's a pleasure is mine. Thank you. And greetings from uh, the eastern part of, it, of Africa, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, to our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, the giant of Africa. Greetings, yes. to all of you. We send our greetings to you as well. Thank you. Prominent entrepreneurs, industry leaders, and government officials from the Nigerian business community in Johannesburg, South Africa, met during the week for a breakfast meeting aimed at addressing some of the challenges confronting them in the country. Trade facilitation, visa challenges, and strategies to enhance business relationships were among the issues discussed. The leaders emphasized the importance of fostering collaboration and synergy between Nigerian and South African businesses in a bid to drive economic growth and mutual prosperity. This breakfast meeting comes at a time when bilateral relations between Nigeria and South Africa have experienced their fair share of challenges, including xenophobic attacks on foreign nationals and strained trade relations. The Nigerian business community converged in Johannesburg with hopes of finding common ground. I'm therefore highly impressed and proud that you have continued to present yourselves as worthy ambassadors of our dear country, Nigeria. As you individually grow in your various fields of endeavor and work tirelessly to add value to your host communities and country, I would like to assure you of the sustained support of the Nigerian government to ensure the success or successes of your businesses. However, some of the paramount concerns of the Nigerian business community in South Africa is the recurring issue of visa and permits to trade. Our challenges are huge and, and uh, multifaceted. You know, first and foremost, when you come here as a doctor, you need to register with the Health Professional Council. For you to register with the Health Professional Council, there are a lot of red tapes that go into that. Number one, immigration. You know, number two is the Foreign Workforce Department. So the immigration department the, doesn't uh, talk to the health department. Um, as a business person, especially in my field of work, which is construction, um, I, I do not see any problems because, um, as you well know, Nigeria doesn't produce quality um, building materials. Uh, Nigerians tend to bring in all their building materials from China. But that seems to be changing. Regulation is a big issue um, on both sides, uh, I think in different ways. Uh, a lot of countries tend to over-regulate, um, and uh, often that's about um, uh, making money, but it actually presents a blockage. And I think there's a lot of room for, for change and, and for addressing problems. But I think a lot of this has to happen at a, at a more people-to-people -people level. And, and, um, and working with governments is important because that, that can move the needle. 
in a way that the private sector can't on its own. So we are hopeful that, that maybe that's where we, we can actually pick this up and run with it. His Excellency Ambassador Mohamed Manta says the visa issue is being addressed at a diplomatic level. The Consular Migration Forum is a meeting of experts in the immigration and consular desk within the foreign ministries of South Africa, uh, of Nigeria, and the Department of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa. That committee has met twice already, and uh, the third meeting is due in, uh, in October this year. Well being of Nigerians, well, generally, I think once in a while you have issues of police high handedness, members of our community bring reports to us. But generally, uh, the Nigerian missions here, the High Commission in Pretoria, the Consulate in Jubok, have established a framework of engagement with the South African authorities. We meet monthly. Hopefully, this meeting will truly pave the way to improve relations and enhance economic cooperation between the two nations. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. You can watch this and other episodes again on youtube.com slash channelsweb and the channels playlist. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.